Good morning, this is Miss Litton, and this is my wonderful Period 1 AP Bio class. Say hi. Hi. All right, and so we are in the middle of our, our Chapter 6, Metabolism, Energy, and Enzymes. And if you are joining us in absent today, we are on Section 6.3, Metabolic Pathways and Enzymes. All right, so here we go. Um, metabolic Pathways, your first term, and orderly sequence of linked reactions an orderly sequence of linked reactions. Okay, and each step is catalyzed by a what? By a specific enzyme. Okay, thinking back, because we're gonna start talking about enzymes, there are four important organic molecules. Could youngest tell oldest the name of those four? Go. Now tell them to me, what are the four? Carbohydrates, Carbohydrates which are built out of? Sugars. 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 Good, give me another one. Proteins, Proteins which are built out of? Amino acids. acids. Lipids, two categories, they are? Fats and steroids. Steroids are built out of what? Four fused rings of carbon. And fats are built out of? Glycerol and fatty acid chains. And those fatty acid chains could be what? Saturated or unsaturated. Perfect. What's your fourth one? Nucleic acids, which are built out of? Nucleotides. Nucleotides are built out of a? Base, phosphate, sugar group. How many bases are there? Five total, right? Four in DNA, four in RNA. Look how smart you are. Okay, you're just like, yeah, I can just tell you that. Now, enzymes, which catalyze each step of these reactions in this metabolic pathway, they are from which important organic molecule? Which, what, what do they represent? Proteins. So enzymes are proteins, and proteins are built out of amino acids. Youngest bio buddy, you went first, right? Yep. Oldest bio buddy, could you please explain primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary structure of a protein? Go. <laughs> is the sequence of amino acids, okay? Secondary structure is either a mm or a mm. Alpha helix or beta pleated sheet. Is that dependent upon the R group? No. Okay, that's just the carboxyl and the amino group, right? And the configuration in space because of the charges on that, okay, on each of those. So primary, secondary, what's next? Tertiary. Tertiary is the folding. folding of the secondary structure. And is that dependent on the R groups? Yes. yes, because some of those R groups are hydrophilic and some are hydrophobic, and it's going to have that three dimensional conformation. What are the proteins that help? I have Kleenex, sweetheart, so you don't have to use paper towel. Here in the back of the room. Make your nose owie. Owie. <laughs> Oh, Max, oh, he's getting more. Stop it, Max. Um, do you remember the name of the proteins that help with the folding and fix it if it's not folded correctly? Chaperone. Yeah, chaperone protein. He, he knew what he meant. Okay, and then what's the next level of structure? Quaternary, and that's if you have more than one chain. Okay, all of that's going to become important as we start to talk about enzymes and remembering those things. So the first thing we want to talk about is when you're doing a metabolic pathway, a lot of times you'll have multiple steps because multiple steps are easier to control and easier to capture the energy that might be um, released. So you want it in small amounts of increments, so small increments. So energy, metabolic pathway under energy. Metabolic energy is captured more easily if it is released in small increments, small increments. Oh, oh, I wonder if it's going to work. Watch, watch this quick video. <coughs> Surface of a catalyst. Number two. Another reactant approaches the catalyst. Number three, rearrangement of electrons 
takes place, that's the reaction, and the products are released from the surface. Okay, blue, go, explain. Ping pong back and forth. can change the rate of a reaction without being involved. No, it's involved. See, he's right there. Without being altered in the process. Without being altered in the process. And B, without changing the free energy change, the difference in the reaction. Without changing the free energy. And at this point, I want you to remember the difference between exergonic and endergonic reactions, dark-shirted one, differentiate between those two. Exergonic and endergonic reactions, go. All right, so this is important to get, and we'll see some more uh, with this in just a minute. But if you started out here in your reaction and you end up here in this reaction, do you think it's an exergonic or an endergonic reaction? Exergonic, because I had a decrease in free energy. What will my delta G be, negative or positive? Negative, negative. good. It's not going to change your initial starting point or your ending point. A catalyst will not change that. What it's going to do is make this reaction more likely to occur. Okay, that's what a catalyst will do. Now. Um, enzymes are just organic catalysts. Organic meaning that it's going to have carbon in it, right? And in this case, most of the enzymes we're going to be dealing with are protein-based enzymes. But there are also, and you know the answer to this, um, where are proteins synthesized? Ribosomes. On ribosomes. So there are things called ribozymes, okay, that will help facilitate that reaction. So you've got a nucleic acid in there as well but most enzymes are protein-based. So enzymes are organic catalysts, usually a protein, and it can increase the reaction rate by more than 10 million times. And then I gave you ribozymes right there in your notes made of RNA, involved in the synthesis of RNA and also um, proteins on ribosomes. Substrate is what you start out with. Okay, so here's a little diagram. I know you're not gonna have any trouble understanding it. So oldest bio, or light-shirted one, just go right through this real quick. You explain it left, right? Based on this picture here, based on this picture, what is the significance of the active site? It's where it attaches to what? The substrate. Is that a matchy-matchy situation going on here? Yes. yes. So if the active site changes, do you think the enzyme is going to work as well? No. no. Now, remember you told me protein structure. Primary what? Secondary, tertiary, quaternary, right? So if you get the wrong amino acid in there, could that affect, if it has a different R group, could it affect the tertiary structure and also the quaternary structure? Yes. And when it does that, it changes the active site. So if, for instance, this is your active site here, but instead this is your active site, is this substrate going to be able to bind on here? No. Is this enzyme going to be able to do his job? No. Okay. That's why the shape of the enzyme is so important. Now, enzymes are proteins. Just, we're going down this road eventually. What are some things that can change a protein shape? Well, if the DNA changes, then yeah, you'll have a different sequence of a primary structure, so that's going to affect your tertiary and quaternary structure. Um, how many of you had eggs for breakfast this morning? Okay, yay, we had one. Was it raw? Okay, good, just checking. Um, because when you crack an egg in a pan, right, 
There's the yolk and then there's the white. We call it the white, but when we first crack it in the pan, what is it? Clear. 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 What are you adding to change it? Heat. Heat. Heat is changing the properties of the protein there and it's going from clear, right, to white. Can you undo that reaction? No, that's not a bell you can unring, okay? Once it's turned white, it's done, okay? That has been permanently denatured. So heat can change proteins. How many of you own a flat iron? Okay, what are we doing when we flat iron our hair? Yeah, we're taking the protein of our hair and we're making it flat, okay? Is that permanent or temporary? It's temporary. And if you get a keratin treatment, any of you get keratin treatments? Of course you do, Matt. It will last a little longer. It'll kind of keep your hair straighter for a longer amount of time, okay? Um, so those are things that are temporary, but if we took our flat irons and went like this on our hair and we held the flat iron on there for, I don't know, let's say 10 to 15 minutes, okay? Could we permanently change our hair? Yes, okay? So things like temperature, things like pH, will change that enzyme structure, which changes its functionality. The active site is critical, okay? So on your notes, where you have active site, it's part of the enzyme that binds temporarily with the substrate. Binds temporarily with the substrate. Any factor that alters the active site, like temperature or pH or an inhibitor, can change the shape of the enzyme and its functionality. And then an enzyme can become denatured. Okay, who explained this one right here? Light shirted. Light shirted? Okay. Dark shirted one. Okay. Look if you um, if you well, dark shirt, just take a run at this. See if you can see it. Use the next thing in your notes. Look, use induced fit model. See if you can understand why did I pick this picture to explain the induced fit model. Go ahead, dark shirt one. <laughs> If you see this as a mouth, do you see how it kind of looks like a bit down? Okay, so it, it what happens there is you can have a temporary change in shape um, of that enzyme in order to facilitate that reaction, but then as soon as it releases the product, it'll go back to its original shape. So that's the induced fit model, okay? So it can undergo a slight change in shape. Um, and then, um, why don't we have youngest bio buddy um, explain it from this point of view. Go ahead, youngest bio buddy. Go over the terms, review it. So in that temporary binding where it might change its shape just for a little bit, that's called the enzyme substrate complex when it's all hooked together. The enzyme substrate and then they're put together, complex. And you only need a little bit of enzyme because it can be reused again and again and again and again. What do you think he's holding there? Do you know who that is? Yeah. Everlasting gobstopper, very good. Okay, so you're not consumed by the reaction. It can be used again and again. And that's what you have next. Um, enzymes are not consumed by the reaction, so only a small amount is required. Only a small amount is required. And then naming of um, enzymes. Enzymes are named oftentimes based on the substrate. So yeah, so we saw this before. Sucrose, the enzyme that digests it is what? Sucrase. Tell your bio buddy, what is sucrose and what builds it? 
What are the two components of it? So sucrose, sucrose is a what? Disaccharide. What are the two components of it? Glucose and fructose. And what is sucrose commonly known as? Table sugar. Good. All right. See how smart you are? Yay. All right. So, um, dark shoot bio buddy. Make a claim. Is this an exergonic or an indergonic reaction? Why do you say that? Exergonic or indergonic? Because you need a we need the person to water the air and push it up. And then and then you'll give energy when you go down. So first to the first from the eight is all right. Okay, so come back to me. Is this exergonic or endergonic? Exergonic, and you said that because overall your delta G is going to be what? Negative, okay? Because you're starting here and you're ending here. However, there's a little hurdle that's right here that you have to go over, and that's called the energy of activation. If I throw logs and kindling in my fireplace, it's not going to spontaneously combust in my fireplace. First, I have to put a little energy into it. What do I use? Match. And that gets the party started, and then it's going to facilitate that reaction. Now, do I have anybody in here who runs track? Anybody in here do hurdles? Okay, those are so scary to me. I watched a kid, like, trip over a hurdle and snap his arm right there, and I'm like, oh, okay? Um, I can tell you uh, that I, I wouldn't do well on hurdles. I have no hip-hop, okay? So if you said, hey, Miss Linton, let's go run some hurdles, and I'm like, yeah, okay. And then if you would take those hurdles, though, and you would go click, 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 so they were really low, like you're going to put them away, I'm all, okay, game on. I could do that because you've lowered the hurdle for that particular one, okay? So I'm going to complete that reaction faster. Do you agree? What if you clicked them and left them up? What would be another way to get me to that inline really fast? Well, you could have a blowtorch behind me, and you could light it, okay, and be like, with your blowtorch. Do you think I would move faster? I would. Could it cause damage? Yes, because I'd be knocking over every hurdle running to the end, right? And... Um, the thing about enzymes is they're very specific. They will go to one lane, lane four, and just lower those hurdles. And so just that reaction is facilitated. Do you see the difference? And so enzymes and are organic catalysts, but any catalyst will take this hurdle, so now it's only this big. So yes, I still have to input a little bit of energy, but not as much to um, have that exergonic reaction take place. Okay, Ex yes? Does that um, make your delta G go higher? Yeah. Okay, so what did I tell you about catalysts and enzymes? It doesn't what? Alter. It doesn't alter your energy change because I'm still starting at the same point and I'm still ending at the same point. Okay, so my delta G remains unchanged. Um, I wanted to ask you there. Um, I'll think of it later. Okay. So go to um, energy of activation, and um, let's go here, okay? Um, energy of activation is the energy that must be added to cause molecules to react. The energy that must be added to cause molecules to react. Yeah, this is what I wanted to say. Okay, so don't look at your notes yet because I wanted you to think of this logically and I already put it in there. Stop, stop looking at it. <laughs> okay, why do we even have an energy of activation? Why is that critical to have that hurdle? Yes? So we don't just spontaneously combust. Yeah, right, we don't fall apart, yeah. right? It kind of holds everything together because otherwise everything would break down all the time, okay? So on your inner benefit of E sub A, the hurdle of energy prevents molecules from spontaneously degrading. Prevents molecules from spontaneously degrading. Now, in this case, I could add heat, okay? I could add heat to the system, and heat will make the molecules move faster, so I'm more likely to go from A, a and B down to C and D. Heat will do that. But an enzyme is something that can specifically lower that hurdle 
just for those reactants A and B because enzymes are proteins and what do you know about proteins? They are always what? Specific. Whatever that enzyme is right here, okay, there is one enzyme that can facilitate A and B going to C and D. So um, enzymes speed up reactions by lowering the inherent, inherent um, energy of activation. They don't change the final energy content. They don't change the final energy content. Now I have two pictures, so why don't we just have youngest bio buddy, you attack the first picture, and then I'll have oldest bio buddy attack the second picture. Explain knowledgeably. Okay, go. Okay. So you don't have to like get up there and go all the way down, it's just a slight hill. We good? It just, it just okay. doesn't see what Now whose turn is it? Oldest, this is yours. Go. Okay, now we call delta G the amount of what? What is delta G called? The amount of? What kind of energy? Activation. No. Overall, change. Change. Look at your notes. What I heard it back there. What kind of energy is it? Free energy. It's energy available to do what? Work. Okay? So I want to jump back, especially because we had some peer counselors that were gone, okay, in a windstorm and miss this lecture, so I wanna go back to this. So gives free energy, is this one of your equations on your AP equation sheet? Yes. So it's free energy available to do work. So this energy right here, G, available to do work. H, enthalpy, is total energy of the system. Here's the total energy of the system. This is energy that is available to do work. So when you're looking at delta G, you're looking at the total energy minus, what does S stand for? What does S stand for? It's right here. Entropy change. Entropy, do you remember disorder, randomness, right? So we're taking the total energy minus the random energy that we can't do anything with, right? And that leaves us the free energy. Okay, that's what we have left to do work. Okay, so if we're increasing our randomness, our disorder, then we're gonna have less energy available to do work. Does that make sense to you? So there's total energy minus the randomness, that's what we have available. So when our delta G has gone negative, we have less energy available to do work, we have less potential energy. But if we have an endergonic reaction, Okay, we're having less randomness, right? In an endergonic reaction, we're ordering the system. We're putting energy into it. Then our delta G can be positive, okay? Quick review of Gibbs free energy, please. Light shoot bio buddy, go. Okay. So, questions on that you want to ask me? All right. So, moving on. So, um, you could have a reactant, but you could get different products depending on what enzyme is there because that enzyme will create different products based on what it is able to do. So I wanna make sure we understand that. There's just not like one end result for that particular reactant. 
And the presence or absence of which enzyme is there is then going to determine what products you have. Okay, so your substrate, what you start out with, depending on what enzyme is there, is going to alter what products you get. Okay, what products you get. Um, also, there are different types. I think you understand this right here. So, dark shoot one, go ahead. Explain the difference between a synthetic or a degradation. Those two reactions, go ahead. Synthetic is just when you take the two substrates and add them together, like using the the active site and enzymes, and they combine together in degradation. It's the opposite. You start with one combined substrate, and then the energy of the enzyme, the active site, and the reaction will turn on into something else. So in a synthetic reaction, what are you doing? Building. Okay, if you're degrading, you're taking it apart, breaking it. breaking it down. And there are multiple types of reactions that you can have. Um, just glance over them. Synthesis, decomposition, single replacement, double replacement. Did you learn these before? Yes, yeah, so you totally understand that. Why doesn't uh, long-haired bio buddy just run through those top to bottom <laughs> long-haired bio buddy? I know, gentlemen. Yes. Are you seeing an enzyme on here? No, but could an enzyme facilitate any reaction? Yes. Was ATP is not needed? It doesn't show any ATP. I'd have energy on the reactant side, right? Yes. Okay. And then A and B are, in fact, the reactants. C and D are the products. Discuss with BioBuddy which one did you struggle with? Or maybe you've got a honey. <laughs> No, intergonic means you need it. 
So this one says ATP is not needed to make the reaction go. That's true. You don't need ATP to make this reaction go. So if it's all less than energy, it's a product that needs that energy. It's a product of this reaction. Are you making the product? Yeah, you didn't need it at the beginning. It came out at the end. Um, I don't have it on the plot side. It's clearly that you have to list the effects of a grand plus pad. And it was in the wood. I wouldn't have said that about it. I wouldn't have said that about it. I wouldn't have said that about it. Okay, now, this one right here, come back to me. Factors affecting enzyme activity. This is going to be your lab. Okay, and I Google Classroom it, okay, um, yesterday, I believe, and we'll talk about it in a minute, we just need to finish going through here. So, certain things will affect um, enzyme activity. One is the substrate concentration. What do you think is going to happen if you increase the substrate? You're going to get more? More. Yeah. Rate, rate of reaction. Okay, rate of reaction will increase because you're going to come in concentrate. You're going to come in contact with that substrate more frequent, more frequently, right? If you increase that um, substrate concentration, also you're going to end up getting more what as a result? Product. <laughs> more reactant means more product. Okay. All right. So our rate of our reaction is going to increase because we have more reactant available to us, right? So our overall rate change over time. So on your notes, let's look where we are. Factors affecting enzyme activity, um, substrate concentration, increased substrate or enzyme and increased reaction rate. We got that. All right, next. Oh, oh, explain what happened here. Explain what do you think happened here, short haired bio buddy? Go ahead. So, oh, it just said it goes fast. You were increasing the substrate, increasing the substrate, increasing the substrate. It kept going faster and faster, but then it wouldn't get any faster. Why? Why do you think? What was getting saturated? The enzyme. Nice. The enzyme was doing all the enzyme molecules were saturated. Their active sites were bound to substrate, so you couldn't move any faster at that point. Does that make sense to you? Okay, it's not going to increase anymore because all the ones that are making the reactions happen, the enzyme are all busy doing their job. Up to this point, you still had available enzyme, available enzyme, available enzyme. Now, that's why it's going to maintain that same rate. Yes? Wait, so the point of saturation. Say wait, you say wait. Yeah. Go ahead. Is the subject concentration <laughs> the same concentration? Is the, is the point of saturation the same concentration as the amount of enzymes? Yes. Well, you can. Yeah, right over there. <laughs> Sure, you don't want to use paper towel again? I don't want to get my nose seal like yours. Oh, uh, okay. So, yes. So, you at that point, all the enzymes, you could still have more substrate out there, but all the enzymes are occupied. Okay? Now, next, let's talk about pH. Now, these are two enzymes that digest protein. One is found in your stomach, and one is found in your small intestine. Which do you think is found where? And support your claim with evidence from this diagram. Oldest bio buddy, go. Uh, All right, come back to me. Where, where do you think pepsin is located? In your stomach. Because your stomach has a very, very low pH. Yeah. It's, your stomach is very acidic. Okay? Come back. Come back. Your stomach is very acidic, and pepsin works best at a lower pH. When your food moves from your stomach into your small intestines, 
your pancreas is releasing sodium bicarbonate, it's trying to neutralize that situation. And this is where trypsin, and there's another one, chymotrypsin, is also there. <laughs> and um, they will help to digest your proteins in your small intestine, but they have to work where the pH is a bit higher. So you have a particular pH, and here's why. You know about that tertiary structure and the way that enzyme folds, it's conformational shape. And if you change the amount of hydrogen ions, that are there, if you have a bunch of hydrogen ions, it could bind to it and alter it in some way. So if you take an enzyme, let's say, and, you add, and it's working in this reaction, all of a sudden you dump some sulfuric acid in it, all of those hydrogen ions are gonna start to bind, and so it's gonna change and alter its shape in relationship to those hydrogen ions that are binding onto your enzyme, so its active site will change as well, okay? And um, changing the shape of an enzyme is one way to control it. It's not a bad thing. Um, I mean, sulfuric acid dumped on you is bad. But if you are in your body, you, you want to activate an enzyme, you want to shut down an enzyme, um, th there, are, there will be ways to control it so you're not wasting and you're facilitating some other reaction. You could also have one that works here at a particular what? Temperature. Temperature. Okay. Um, do you remember the three domains? Oldest bio buddy, name the three domains that we have discussed. Go and decide which one is the extremophile. Go. Okay, what are the three domains? Archaea, bacteria, eukarya. Who are the extremophiles of the three domains? Okay, archaea, and where can they live? Crazy place. They'd be really salty, like halophiles. Thermoacidophiles can function where there's a very low pH and a high temperature. So their enzymes don't denature at those high temperatures where maybe ours would, right? They're endothermic organisms like yourself, right? We, we use the words instead, you're, you're familiar with warm-blooded and what? Cold-blooded, okay? So we would say we're warm-blooded. It doesn't matter if it's 30 degrees outside or 60 degrees outside, your body's still gonna function. Who doesn't function like that? Lizard. Got in my car yesterday. It's parked in the garage. Ginormous lizard is sitting on my air conditioning vent heating. It's just like this, and I'm like, what are you doing here? Why have you come? It was super annoying. So then, it's not like I'm afraid of lizards, but I was like, I gotta catch this thing. I'm thinking it's gonna crawl in my car and die, and then it's gonna smell. That would be really bad. So I used a rag, and then I like got him in a corner, and then I'm like, come out. I didn't kill him. I'm like, get out, get out. Now get out of the garage. But it was this huge lizard, and he was just like, I am here, okay? <laughs> he, we call those, we think of it as being cold-blooded because depending on the temperature is how active he's going to be, right? because he doesn't have things like we do, like body fat, to maintain his body temperature. So his enzymes will only function if he's warm enough to have them function. Okay, I saw a hand somewhere. No? All right, so specific pH, specific temperature, go to your notes. Um, optimal pH where the enzyme maintains its structural configuration and therefore its active site. Temperature, typically as the temperature rises, the enzyme activity rises up to a point until it denatures, until it denatures, and that's that sharp drop off you're seeing right here. And speaking of ectothermic organisms, here's one, and here you have an endothermic organism, okay? <laughs> yeah, until you take your face off. Okay, <laughs> Siamese cats. Um, they've inherited a mutation that causes an enzyme to be active only at cooler body temperatures, so only certain regions of their body are darker and some regions of them are lighter, based on body temperature and what enzyme is functional. Okay. Um, okay, youngest bio buddy, um, see if you can explain what is going on in this process. Go ahead, youngest bio buddy, go. So, who's helping the substrate to 
bind on or to activate this enzyme? A cofactor, okay? So on your notes, you have enzyme cofactors and coenzymes. Cofactors are what by definition? Inorganic, okay? So it could be something like zinc or iron that would facilitate that reaction. Coenzymes are organic, but they're non-protein. Because if they were a protein, they'd just be part of the enzyme. Do you see that? Okay, so it's organic, non-protein. An example, NAD, we're gonna learn about him later. Vitamins are oftentimes coenzymes and you need them in very small amounts. Some are trace that you need in order to facilitate that reaction. Yes? Could the change in pH be the enzyme changing? Yes, absolutely. Yes, it could absolutely alter it permanently, for sure. Okay, um, and then this was not discussed right now, but I'm gonna throw it in there and you can add it in your notes. They, I don't think they talked about it exactly in your book, but I wanna talk about this phosphorylation. Sometimes an enzyme needs to be activated. Um, where could you find a phosphate group? Like phosphate. Adenosine triphosphate. So sometimes you need a phosphate group to activate it. That's called phosphorylation. Um, so you can add that into your notes too as something that can affect um, um, underneath our um, factors affecting enzyme activity. You can make it your number five, phosphorylation. Now, the next part, um, enzyme inhibition. Um, and remember, shutting down an enzyme is not necessarily a bad thing. You just may not need whatever that product is, so you wanna switch it off. So there's a couple of different ways to regulate them. One is called competitive inhibition and one is non-competitive inhibition. I want it to make sense to you. Light shirted bio buddy, see if you can differentiate what's the difference between competitive and non-competitive, go ahead. They're both altering the enzyme's functionality, right? But if it's a competitive inhibitor, what is it binding to? The active site. So it's competing with who? Who is it competing with? The substrate. So it's competing with the substrate for the active site. Um, in non-competitive inhibition, it's not binding to the active site, it's binding to a secondary site, which is often called an allosteric site. And by binding to that secondary site, it sets off a series of uh, um, reactions within that enzyme, so it ultimately changes its shape of its active site. For instance, let me give you, this is a stupid example, but it'll work. If um, our reaction was for me to run around and grab you and your, some other person to put your hands together and to join you together, and that was the product. So as I'm running around, running around, running around, what's the active site of me? My hands, my hands are the active site, right? But if my children, this worked when they were younger, not when they're 22 and 19, but if my children came in here and held my hands, okay, what kind of inhibitors would they be? Competitive inhibitors. Competitive inhibitors because they're competing for my hands, which are my active site, right? Now, what if instead, um, Mr. Lab now ran in here and he was all, I want this classroom, and he poured acid on my back, okay? <laughs> he and I are friends, he did not do that. So he pours acid on my back. Did he change my hands at all? Did he pour acid on my hands? No, no. but as a result of him doing that, okay, am I gonna change my body shape? Yes, I'm like, oh, my back, okay? So it, by changing, by being on one area, it changes my active site indirectly. Okay, so that's my back would be that allosteric site, that secondary site. Okay, that's kind of a bad example, but okay. He didn't actually put or alter my hands at all. Okay, um, now let's take a look at this. This is called um, feedback um, inhibition. 
So take a look at what's happening here. Here's reactant A, A goes to B, B goes to C, C goes to D, D goes to E, E is your end product, okay? And your end product, whatever that is, can go in your enzyme, your first enzyme that went from A to B, here's your reactant, how it fits in there. But when the end product binds to a secondary site, like an allosteric site, what happened to the active site? When you look at before and now, changed it, right? So now you have stopped this whole metabolic sequence just by inhibiting the very first enzyme, okay? The very first enzyme is inhibited. So you have A to B, B to C, da 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 da. Your end product goes back, alters that initial enzyme, and then ends up stopping the whole reaction. So on your notes, enzyme inhibition occurs when a molecule, the inhibitor, binds to an enzyme and decreases its act, um, activity. Its activity. Non-competitive inhibition inhibitor binds to the enzyme at a location other than the active site. Other than the active site, the second site is called the allosteric site, which, if bound to the inhibitor, <coughs> indirectly changes indirectly changes the shape of the active site. Indirectly changes the shape of the active site. End product inhibition, negative feedback. The final product inhibits the initial reaction of the metabolic pathway from occurring, increases the efficiency of the pathway by turning it off when the end product accumulates in the cell. And I believe I gave you everything for competitive inhibition and youngest bio buddy, tell them what that is. And differentiate, tell them what competitive inhibition is and differentiate with non-competitive. Yes. Normal process. Yeah, yeah. If you don't need any more of a particular hormone or something else, you don't want to synthesize anymore, you don't want to keep making that. So you want to be like, oh, I'm done, I'm done. Whatever. Goes Normal the process. Other one to the shape, the shape. Yeah. 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 Have, have you heard of carbon monoxide poisoning? Yes. Yeah. So what happens is um, your red blood cells containing your 250 million molecules of hemoglobin, um, they can bind to, each hemoglobin molecule can bind to four oxygen molecules. So you have a billion molecules of oxygen within each red blood cell, that capability. What carbon monoxide does is it competes for the active site on the hemoglobin, it competes for that site, so instead of oxygen being there, what's there instead? Carbon monoxide. So now all of a sudden, your red blood cells are not transporting oxygen to your tissues, they're transporting what? carbon monoxide. And as a result of that, what ends up happening is you don't have enough oxygen. If you don't have enough oxygen, you're going to get sleepy and tired. And that's why they get very worried about um, heating units in small spaces, whether it's an RV or somebody living in your garage. Um, then you could have um, that carbon monoxide. It makes you tired. You'll actually get nauseous, sick. That's a sign of it as well. And then people end up falling asleep and then they don't have enough oxygen, what could then happen? They could what? Die. Die. Yeah. And so you need to get away from that carbon monoxide that's binding, because it binds, it will continue to bind there in, until the carbon monoxide is removed from that environment. Okay? So that would be a bad thing. A good thing would be if you are making something like synthesizing a protein like tryptophan, and you need more tryptophan for whatever you're doing out of your 20 amino acids, but once you have enough tryptophan, you don't want that enzyme making any more of it because you want to take your resources, your amino acids, and maybe you want to make lysine or something else. So you want to stop the tryptophan production, and oftentimes feedback can do that. Yes? Um, about the carbon monoxide. Yes. Um, so you said it like, takes down the separation of oxygen. So how does it work if it's going to be oxygen that pushes off into space? Well, afterwards? I don't understand all of the chemistry behind that. I know that. It said, I have read that it binds irreversibly, but it, obviously you have so many areas to have oxygen bind, it must be okay eventually, yeah. As long as you're getting completely away from that carbon monoxide. Yeah, you wanna get out. If you're ever in that situation, you're sleepy, tired, you're like in a motorhome, an RV or something like that, and you're getting sleepy and tired and start to get nauseous, check the heating system. 
Okay, usually they have detectors in there that will tell you if there's a problem with them. All right, let's see how we do on your questions. It's a map. More maps. Go peeps. Commit, commit, commit. Come on, Ruthie. Right. Was it a man? Yes, it was a man. 78%. Okay. Let's see what our legend was. Okay, so a couple of you picked A. The active site of a specific enzyme is similar to that of any other enzyme? No. Active sites are what? Specific. They're specific to the substrate. So that's why we would rule out A. Definitely it's where the substrate can fit. It can be used over and over again. It is affected by environmental factors. Okay, check with your bio buddy. See if they need some clarification, some chastisement, some phrasement. Yes, I would <laughs> This is written in a hideously tricky way, so just be careful of this. Do not. Oh, yeah, do not increase. So all of those, right? If you want to, how could you restate this question? If you want to increase the amount of product per unit time of an enzymatic reaction, okay, it says don't do this. So all of these must increase the rate of the reaction except one. Or two or three. Right, or two or three or four. temperature somewhat? Yes. Not if I increase the temperature really high. I just said somewhat. Why if I increase the temperature somewhat? What will happen inherently to the system if you increase the, the temperature? It'll be, faster. It'll be faster. The kinetic energy is increased, right? How about if I change the pH? No. Okay. Changing the pH will change the shape of the enzyme, change the shape of the active site. Okay. Check with your bio buddy. See if they get it now. What held them up before? Was it tricky one? Okay, 
we almost all got it right. How did you know to pick true? What was your hint? Maybe because it said it here? Okay, but the active site was here. Was your inhibitor binding to your active site? No, if it was binding to your active site area, it would be competitive inhibition. It's binding to a secondary site, the allosteric site, so it is non-competitive. Check with your bio buddies, see if they were part of the 89%. Yes. secondary site. Active site, allosteric site, two different things. Look right back here at this question that we just did. Here's the active site where the enzyme binds. The allosteric site is a secondary site. Okay, next. Non-protein in nature. No, it's part of the enzyme, so it is a protein. Okay, I'm not talking about a cofactor or, or a coenzyme. It's, it's on the enzyme, the allosteric site. Okay, where ATP attaches, didn't say that at all. Okay. I did mention phosphorylation, but that's not the role of the allosteric site. Okay. It, 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 could it involve feedback inhibition? Yes. Because your end product could bind to the allosteric site in order to stop that reaction. Okay. Check with your bio buddy uh, because only half of you got that right. So talk about it right now with your bio buddy. Okay. Now. Okay, I'm going to go real quick through this because I want to make sure to set up your, um, hey, why didn't I pick your team? I want to make sure to set up your um, lab for next time. Yes. Oh, yes, I can. So we will pick up here in just a minute. Hope you're having a good day. <laughs>